But the question is, will we get the optimal adaptation, right? If we're hitting each one of these once a week, will that give you as strong of an adaptation as really focusing on one? And I think my gut would probably say, I would probably tend to think the latter is more true in the sense of you'll always get better by focusing on one thing than by trying to do too many things at once. Now, admittedly, this comes out of sports training, but the same thing holds, right? If you are a cyclist and you're trying to build your endurance and your climbing and your sprinting, you're not doing anything particularly well. If you're a beginner, fine, you can get away with it. But at the higher levels, you need to do targeted blocks, which leads into the periodization thing. Although, again, context, and I'll loop back around to one of the best presentations I ever saw, uh, NSCA thing years ago. So if you're a beginner, it may not matter, right? And maybe training all, maybe training all of them will be beneficial because it will, in theory, keep, if you're keeping everything ratcheting up the same level, you're not getting a weak point. But as you get to higher and higher levels, you just can't do it all, right? If you look at the daily undulating periodization research, and for folks that are not familiar with that terminology, the idea was that every day you did a different repetition range, right? So rather than doing four weeks of 15s, four weeks of 10s, and four weeks of 8s, or whatever, you did one day of 15s, one day of 8s, and one day of 10s, or 10, 3, whatever it was. But when you start to look at those papers, right, like every day was a limit day, right? Now you're just training to absolute fit three times a week. And I seem to recall there was some burnout over time. I haven't looked at this data in a really long time. But it's like, okay, some of the early heavy light medium systems like Bill Starr were very similar, right? It's like, all right, we got your max, your max fives day or even starting strength, some of the uh, Texas method stuff. But you're like, all right, when you get to now, light can be 75% of the heavy day or it can be eight and the medium or it can be 12s or whatever, but it was never quite to failure. The daily Julian periodization stuff was always like rep max loads. And I do think you get to a point that maybe you're not training anything as a, now, okay, well, should you just train heavy twice a week? If you're very strong, you will grind yourself down with that, right? If you look at like, so my generic bulking routine, you've got upper, lower, two, two heavy days for a week. That's really an intermediate program. You get to the advanced level, you're looking at something like a heavy light where you do heavy fives to eights one day, heavy 12s to 15s, the other day, right? Like Lane Norton's fat, whatever that stands for, P-H-A-T. Um, just because you can't handle two heavy days in a row. But even at that point, you're not trying to do all three at once. But then you'll get people that'll be like, all right, well, I'll do fives one day and I'll do some 12 to 15s and then finish it up with some, with a couple sets of 30. Maybe you do it all in the same workout, right? Power bodybuilding. We're going to do heavy fives on squats. We're going to do... 12 to 15 on a leg press, and then we're going to do 30s on the leg extension. You're probably too young to remember Hatfield's holistic training, which is exactly what that was. Again, he put it in fiber typing things. So you would do, he, and, and he was wrong about one thing profoundly. He believed, well, he believed two things. He said, one, there is no such thing as central overtraining. As long as you rotate muscle groups, you cannot overtrain. Okay, that's wrong. <laughs> it's hilarious. But he also believed there was no overlap in fatigue between rep ranges or fiber types. So one of his workouts, and my training partner did this, you would go a max set of five in the squat, go straight to the hack squat for 12 to 15, go straight to the leg extension for a set of 40. And then with no rest, because there's no fatigue, you go <laughs> right back to squats. My training partner did this. He got through the first circuit. He was crawling across the gym to get back to the squat rack. He, by God, he was going to do it if it killed him. So you've got those types. Of, and I would do that, you know, going back to the original thing. If you're probably going to suck at reps, it's probably going to be that heavy complex compound. So cool. Keep that for your low reps. Go to a machine, compound machine, isolation machine, do 12s. You might be better at, and then for the high reps, definitely do a nice. So yeah, there's so many different ways to do it. You can do it on different days. Probably different days as a bodybuilder is, are you going to do full body all three days? How are you going to split this up? Because if your volume is even moderate, to do eight sets per muscle group, full body, when there's quads, hamstrings, glutes, pecs, back, delt, you're looking at eight months where you can do 64 sets. 
Are you going to train six days a week so you can do upper, lower, upper, lower, upper, lower? You run very rapidly into practice. And it's different if you're talking about performance sports. Because if you look at most of these periodization studies, they're not on bodybuilders. They're on athletes in the sense of football, soccer, basketball. And it's like they'll do squat, bench, row, some futzing around, and that's it. They're not training like bodybuilders. So that becomes a practical issue. It's probably easier to do them on the same workout because quads, are, you know, if you're training quads, cool, do five sets, five or two sets, five, do four sets, 12 in leg press, do two sets, of leg extensions. Trust me, you'll be cooked. Or you can do them sequentially, right? And this is one of those sort of theoretical models I've had in my head for, like I said, about 10 years. One of these days, I'll run. It's like, okay, then let's assume that. These factors are not only that they are somewhat independent, which I think is a fair, fair, fair assumption, but that they can become the roadblock to progress, right? Now, we know even when people decided that doesn't matter what rep range you use, if you looked at the practical recommendations, like Eric Helms, folks like that, it was like, yeah, still do like most of it in the 6 to 12 range. Do some heavier work. Do some lot like trust me. Doing sets thirty to thirty to five sucks. It's an inefficient way to get to the good stuff. Doing lots of lower rep sets tends to grind people down and grind down their joints. Do seventy five percent of it in the hypertrophy range and then touch it up with the other stuff. So I can make an argument for okay, maybe let's do two weeks of you know muscular endurance, high rep, short rest, whatever you want to call it, metabolic weight training. Uh, depletion training is what I call it in Ultimate Diet 2, whatever, right? And you're going to do sets 15 to 20, fairly, you know, two up, two down, do light load training, do BFR if you really want, fairly short rest period, it'll suck. It will totally suck. But do that to hopefully build some mitochondrial function, maybe some capillary density, whatever else, you know, some glycogen storage capacity, buffering of acidosis. I think for most bodybuilding applications, the biggest block should be the traditional hypertrophy block, right? Like, yeah, doing that can probably get some growth. I don't know who's going to do that exclusively, consistently, because it's just a miserable way to train. Except, again, it looks great on Instagram, and that's really what this is all about right now. But big picture, right? I think the main block of it is going to be more traditional where you're doing, you know, in the six, the traditional hypertrophy range, maybe touching it up with, split. but then I do think there's a benefit. And this is in your outline. And I still got to come back to that, that presentation that I think ties into this. I do think short blocks of maximal strength work, by which I mean sort of power fives and sets of fives and below very heavy weights, I think that could be beneficial in small amounts for bodybuilders because I do think the neurological components often go untrained or not optimally trained in bodybuilders, right? There's always been kind of the, it's like, oh, bodybuilders are bigger than they are strong, which is true. Most natural, but most big natural bodybuilders are strong, but proportional to their size, they're not powerlifter strong because they don't practice the low reps. Of course, if you take a big bodybuilder and train them like a powerlifter for three months, they will kill everybody, right? One of my favorite old stories, this was in the early 90s when American Gladiators started. So what they do, they took a bunch of bodybuilders of the day and they put them against athletes. And for the first two years, the bodybuilders got stomped. Just they just got abused by these little 160 pound guys that could move. And two years later, they became unstoppable. The bodybuilders now had all that muscle mass that they had learned neurologically how to use in those events. And they were effing unstoppable. The first means I took Sumi T, there's this female powerlifter junior. She was an extremely successful bodybuilder. She was jacked to all hell. Someone got a hold of her and said, can I train you like a powerlifter for two months? And she went in and set every rec, like picture perfect form, picture perfect technique. Because when you take all that muscle mass and teach it how to do that, but at the, by the same token, right, 
working from the general idea that over time you need to add weight to the bar, that can become limiting because neurological aspects, if that, if your neurological components, and that describes a lot of stuff I won't get into, are limiting, touching that up, bumping that up a little bit can help. Doing a little three to four week cycle where you really push, do some, do some triples, do some fives, as long as you do it safely. When you go back to the bodybuilding work, your poundages will, right? Because if you take a power lifter, you take these Olympic lifters that are strong as hell, and many of them are not very heavily muscled, it's kind of because they just have great mechanics and great leverages, and you have them do bodybuilding work, they explode because they're like their neurological pathways are so well tuned, they can just add weight and add weight and accept progressive tension overload. But that wouldn't be a majority of it. I think if you look at the power building stuff, the heavier stuff is right on that cusp. They're like, eh, five to eight is the power stuff. And then you do your pump. And even then you go back to uh, McCallan, he, uh, whatever his book was, his old bolt program, five sets, five with two mat, with two warm ups, three heavy sets, eight sets of 10 on 30 seconds. You do your tension work. You do your pump work. None of this is new. Nothing I've ever said is new, hardly. So then the question is, all right, so is it better to sequence them? Is it better to do them all at once, do them all in the same workout? And I think it does sort of depend. Um, one issue that we do have to consider, and this is more of a sports thing, right? The whole periodization thing. Back in the day, did your six weeks of endurance, six weeks of intervals, six weeks of speed work. And what people found, or even in the weight room, you did your hypertrophy and your strength and your power, and what people found is that, oh, when you're doing your hypertrophy stuff, you're losing your top end. When you're doing your top end stuff, you tend to shrink a little bit. And then some somebody 20 years ago was like, all right, well, when we get into the threes and fives, why don't we do like two back off sets of eight to 10? Boom, growth wasn't lost. Now, I think some of it was glycogen water, but it doesn't matter. Then we get into the idea of maintaining loads or, re, or retaining loads, whatever you want to call it. And in sports training, this is the new model. Rather than doing things exclusively sequentially, even when you're in a primary endurance block, you do a little bit of top. You know, you never want to lose your top end. Hypertrophy, you maybe do, you know, a little bit of it. You don't want to lose that endurance you worked so painfully to develop. So you start seeing over where it's a primary focus and maybe a little bit of the other work, right? So Isarin has his block training, which is really just old school linear on a shorter time frame. And he's like, all right, for six weeks, you pick one, maybe two capacities. And you do maintenance loads, which means very low volume, just a little bit of it for everything else. Then you move to your next focus maintain what you know endurance is easier to maintain than anaerobic stuff again this is sports performance but i think it can apply so again which is best so let me go back to this presentation this is an nsca an nsca thing on periodization models and this guy was like all right we got linear we got your daily undulating periodization then we got some of the block training conjugate you know the advanced stuff and they all seem to kind of work, but his his premise, and this is where I thought he goes, but if you look at the studies, you start to look really in depth, what it matter, what it depends on is the training status. For beginners, linear works fine, right? If I'm training a beginner, if you're training a beginner, we're gonna start with lightweight, focus on technique, build the volume up gradually, because that works. Over time, we'll go a little bit heavier, maybe bring the repetition range down. Do it again. Reset. You go until that. But at the intermediate level, you can still kind of bring everything up. You're not so strong that you're going to grind yourself down with too much heavy work. Maybe they, and, he, and his point was in the middle range or for the athletes that need a variety of capacities but don't need to maximize anything, that's where daily undulating periodization comes in. You've also, with athletes, you've got to work in their sports training. Like they don't have huge blocks to devote to strength training because basketball players are not weight room athletes. Football players are not weight, well, I mean, kind of, but you know what I mean. Their sports training take, so it's like, well, we have limited time. We have limited movements we need to do. We can do a little bit of everything and that's probably better. But then at the advanced levels, as you, especially with strength and power athletes, you can't optimally develop everything at once because you are spreading your, adaptational energy <laughs> to pull a term out of of the ether it's 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 voodoo it is it's voodoo but it there's something to it 
The Russians called it the current adaptational reserve because the Russians didn't care if something sounded like voodoo as long as it worked. <laughs> There's something to it. They're, the body has a limited amount that it can adapt to. And I mean, we can see this. A bench specialist is always better at the bench than a three lift specialist. Triathletes, especially in the early days, were not good swimmers, cyclists, or runners. They were mediocre at everything. Compa they're better now, but compared to individual athletes, decathletes relatively are mediocre at 10 things as opposed to being great at any one. So, but the body can only, and, and this is with my, my model, the advanced level, I pro program specialization cycles because you're not going to bring every muscle group up once you're year three or four. You pick two muscle groups, you just hammer the hell out of them. And if you want to get, if you want to get really theoretical, look at wheelchair athletes. In a very real sense, right? Their upper bodies tend to be jacked. And if you want, you know, well, they're not having to put energy or mean or to maintain or even build lower body muscle mass. One of the best benchers I ever trained, she had a hip injury. We barely squatted her. Her upper body was huge because every bit of training she did went to that. So at the advanced level, you do need to, you just can't spread yourself too thin. If you're trying to develop neural pathways, you need to train those more frequently, right? Look at what all the strength power guys are doing. Like higher frequency training is currently in because to maximize practice neural pathways, all that stuff, you've got to do it once a week. And I mean, all powerlifters did it once a week for decades. Powerlifting, again, is unique as a sport. I know of no other sport where you can train your sporting activity once a week and get anywhere. West Side Bear didn't train it at all, right? I again, this is why I love powerlifting. I love the community. I love the sport. It should never be used as a model of training for any other sport because it it none of the rules apply any more than bodybuilding should. Are there lessons we can take from it? Sure. Show me any other sport where you run once a week and can be elite. It doesn't there's no sport I can think of. Anyway, so yeah, you're going to have to train, but at the same time, you don't want to lose those other adaptations. So in practice, what do we see powerlifters doing now? They do a little bit of work at 90%, kind of year-round. Like not grindy, but enough to keep that practice in. And then first half of a cycle, they might focus mainly on you know either assistance to bring up weak points, hypertrophy work to support the assistance work. And then as we get closer to, site, closer to meet, then you maintain your hypertrophy work or your donkey work you maybe maintain some assistance work i do think louis simmons was right he said what makes you strong keeps you strong don't you never drop it out but again you don't take it out completely because at that point and again so it's how i train sumi right we have a 13 week cycle the last six weeks going to the meet focus she does a max out day once a week right so the first six or seven weeks building up her competition work, but it's mainly focusing on driving up the assistance work or supplemental stuff and her hypertrophy stuff. But at week, but three weeks out, everything is at maintenance other because I want her entire focus mentally and I want all of her adaptational energy going into the competition lifts. I've already built, but I maintain it. She might do only one top set versus three, but I never drop that out even the week of the meet for her. Again, smaller female. My point all just being that the current model, at least for sports training, is you never completely stop training any. It's a matter of priorities. Again, but with bodybuilding, we're not looking at such differential aspects. But I do think at the advanced level, like the angel periodization, you're just kind of throwing one okay stimulus at any one of these given potentially preferential adaptations. So I think doing, you know, and I would, if I were going to do like, well, if somebody's metabolic fitness, if their conditioning was way down, they might need to do a longer block of, of that metabolic work till they, till they fitness, fitness endurance takes longer to improve. It's really boring. It's crappy, unfun training. But, but even, you know, when people do my ultimate diet too, the first two weeks of depletion training, they just curse my name. It's just the worst crap ever. And then it, it, a lot of that stuff happens pretty quickly locally, some of the general fitness stuff, and maybe do a little extra aerobic work, get your fitness up. By the time you're able to get through that full metabolic workout and come out without being completely wrecked, 
All right, you've gotten the adaptation. Now we move into, you know, your primary hypertrophy block. We're going to focus on that 6 to 12 traditional range. And going back to the original question, maybe maybe on a certain movement, it's you're only good for sixes or fives or whatever. Just because that's you, you've learned that you cannot add reps or add or, or progress in a higher rep range. Cool. Do that. If you want to do some sets of 12, do it on something you can progress for higher reps. If you still want to throw in, you know, a miserable, you know, a, a finisher set of 30 to 35 to get keep that metabolic, sure. More power to you. Um, or, you know, do that once a week or however often you train your muscle group. And then after you've done a couple cycles of that, and the way I program hypertrophy cycles is usually a couple week buildup and then anywhere from six to 10 weeks of really pushing it hard because that gives you a, a two to three month. It's a nice concrete training block. Eight, you know, if you burn out, if you're done at six, go ahead and you're done. And if you can keep going for four more weeks, that's 12 weeks. Maybe you do a couple of those in a row, then do like a three or four week you know, power phase, strength phase, where you do some very heavy work only on the big compounds. I mean, that can be leg press, squat, machine chest press, bench press, if you're good at it. Like you, you don't generally want to do leg extensions for fives. I've done it. I've done lateral raise machine for fives. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it, but you can, um, do a little bit of, you know, do a little bit of volume stuff afterwards. Right. That was if you look again at Bill Starr's stuff as he got into the advanced levels. Right. Once they got into the triples and the volume total daily, like, all right, then we do two sets of 10 to get the tonnage. Again, there's really nothing new to any of this. It's just a matter of how you how you're sequencing it. And you can do it all in the same workout, all in the same week over a sequential block. And I think it really depends on beginner, intermediate, advanced. For advanced, I would probably do it as a block. You know, and yeah, if you can somehow determine that you do have a specific bottleneck, you might ignore all of this and go, all right, look, it, someday, here's my dream for the world. And maybe this is the wrong thing to talk about as we enter an authoritarian world. I want a biosensor that we can just implant in the body that will measure all of this. Amino acids, blood glucose, insulin, hormones, all this stuff. And once a month, we're all going to go and we're going to get the, bar head, the, the barcode on our forehead scanned. All this data is going to go into the big computer and is going to be the biggest. We're going to know everything about everything. But right now, we don't have any good way to determine is your, you know, mitochondrial function the limiter? Is it ribosome? You know, so there's a little bit of guesswork here, and I don't know that I've had anything concrete. Hopefully we'll get there at some point. I've been waiting for someone to come up with a spot testosterone to cortisol spit test because I want to see people at the gym going, it's time to quit training because I think that would be awesome. Um, we're not there yet. So there may be a little bit and maybe the idea is just rotate them. You know, maybe that's why, right? There's this old idea, like, I love it. The best workout's the one you're not doing. Oh, stop. I don't. <laughs> That I hate that kind of trite crap, but it's like, you know, or, oh, when this stop uh, in powerlifting, oh, if your bench is stalled, stop benching. No, that is so, <laughs> that is terrible advice. But in, you know, but in bodybuilding, it's like, oh, whenever I change routines, which then becomes variety, which then becomes mix it up, which then becomes muscle confusion, which is a whole different level of stupid. But yeah, okay, fine. You've been, and, and okay, is it why? Sometimes I think it's psychological. People get bored. I don't. Depends on your personality. So I was a good endurance athlete. I don't get bored. I can do the same workout for a year on end until it breaks me. But by and large, some people get bored much more quickly, you know, and maybe it's your plot. Maybe it's an intensity thing. Maybe it's a novelty issue. This is something they've started to address in the research. Oh, we, had, we looked at what people were doing before the study. Because maybe it's not the volume. Maybe it's not the sets and reps. Maybe it's because what we're having them do is different than what they did before. And this is an important consideration. Because most people, if they're training the way people typically train, if you move them to six sets per muscle group, that may be one-fourth of what they were doing, right? It's, it, but hypothetically, could that change in training be targeting one of these pathways that had become the limiter. Now, I'm not saying it does. I'm not saying it is or it isn't. 
And I'm saying, I have to wonder if that's the case. I have to wonder that if someone has hit a block, they're working in that five rep range and they just hit a plateau. And suddenly they're, I'm going to 12. And then all of a sudden, oh, I'm making new progress again. And for, is it because it's training a slightly different and undertrained component of the system? It wasn't. Now, again, in the modern era, most people do a mixture, right? I always kind of get annoyed when people are just like, you know, powerlifters this because they and bodybuilders are this. And I'm like, I don't know any powerlifters in the modern era that only do triples. Back at, every once in a while, there are systems like that. But to talk about, oh, powerlifters are bigger than bodybuilders or whatever, it's like every powerlifter I know in the modern era does hypertrophy work. Nobody is doing explicitly one or the other for the most part. Bodybuilders are less likely to do the power work or the heavy work. But then again, power, I've watched power building come around. Oh God, it must've been a dozen times. And I've been, I've been in this field a really long time and everything old is new again. And people decide they don't want to be all show and no go and be strong. And so they are training a little bit of everything anyway. So yeah, I have to wonder if that's not the case, if maybe it's a function of, all right, because then you rotate back and suddenly the stimulus that kind of you hit a, a rot, you know, hit a wall on, maybe because you've eliminated a different weak point, right? If you look at West Side, which is more about strength, well, if your weak point in the bench is lockout, you do pin presses or board presses or whatever. Now you identify the new weak point because training your strong point is not going to improve your bench anymore. Olympic lifters, Chinese Olympic lifters, every two weeks, their coach determines what's limiting. They do a two-week block to fix that weak point with specialized movements, and then they rotate them. And in a bodybuilding, in a bodybuilding standpoint, we're looking more at physiological components, like we talked about, capillaries, mitochondria, ribosomes, androgen receptor, some of which may be we can train and maybe we can't, neural pathways. and I don't see fundamentally why one, I don't think any single form of training can possibly train all of them optimally. Something, even assuming they were equal to begin with, if someone is starting with something as a higher point, whatever is limiting is going to become more limiting over time because it won't, unless you do specific work to catch it up. And this is all totally hypothetical and completely, un, un, cannot be applied on any meaningful level yet, but I'm hoping that someday we'll be able to like, whatever, stick the biosensor, or pull the Star Trek thing and be like, boom, you've got piss poor ribosomes. Let's implement a ribosome train. I'm surprised nobody's done that. I thought about it, but all I've seen is that you train and your ribosomal activity either goes up or it doesn't. I will say, related to this, and steroids are not my area of expertise by any stretch, but I've at least seen some people or some research that it's like, okay, because in a sense, any anabolic should be the same, right? Like why? Why does taking multiple different drugs work better than just taking more of one? And I seem to recall like they do have slightly differential effects. Like one of them, Winstrol unbinds testosterone from the binding globulin. So if you take that, so if you take testosterone to jack up test, Winstrol gives you more free test. I think one of them specifically improves ribosomal activity. And I think through hook and by crook, bodybuilders have kind of found like, okay, this one is going to jack up testosterone as a base. This is going to sort of get this pathway and this pathway. And maybe we're getting a, a synergy of results. Um, the, the question then is, can we do anything uh, in terms of training with that? Pure gold. I, I thoroughly enjoyed every bit of that, Lyle. But I think, again, you mentioned this is all theoretical, right? But I think these Very discussions much. are super valuable because if if we look at the current research on periodization and, and, the, and the reviews we have, we would conclude, well, periodization doesn't matter for hypertrophy, but it, it's kind of a stretch, right? Because when we look at the models used in the research setting, they're, they're not to get as jacked as possible. Muscle hypertrophy is more or less a secondary outcome that we're looking at, and they were designed to improve performance in, in, in a given sport. So... If we look at that, we could say that, you know, periodization doesn't matter, but as a concept, it does seem valuable. And you touched on this theoretical model and my ex 
I had the same exact thoughts coming to mind, and that was if if we consider the contributors to muscle hypertrophy and performance, and we look at the variety of rep ranges we can utilize, I think it does seem like a good idea that we primarily use these blocks within the traditional hypertrophy rep range of 6 to 12, and then every few blocks, probably we should utilize some sort of maximal strength block where we're, we're primarily working in those lower rep ranges, and then also in those in those traditional hypertrophy blocks, maybe we do, you know, just tack on some, some metabolic work at the end, just to kind of preserve that fitness component. And then in regard to utilizing a specialized metabolite or work capacity block, maybe we just use those on an as needed basis, right? Cause, cause we have a little bit of that in the traditional blocks. And then, you know, if you find that your fitness is, you know, decreasing to a point where it's significant, it's limiting your your performance, then maybe we throw in a specialized block. But outside of that, just uh, utilize some touch-up work with your traditional hypertrophy training, and then maybe throw on a maximal strength block here and there just to really ramp up those neural adaptations yep. and possibly potentiate your, your future more traditional hypertrophy phase. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, yeah, basically a... Um... And, and like I said, if you look back at sort of the history, I mean, weight training has gone in bodybuilding in cycles and cycles and cycles. And, you know, none of these are particularly new ideas. Um, you know, in the old, yeah, do some heavy work, do some pump work, maybe do, you know, some really, really miserable high pump work. And that seems to kind of kind of get it. Um, I think even if you look at, you know, what we what seems to be the case with all right, heavy tension training, mainly the muscle fibers. The pump training, higher volume, and and this makes sense biochemically, right? Higher volume, shorter rest is going to be stressing metabolic components more so than the myofibrillar. You're not generating as you can with fatigue, but if but it is it is a metabolic issue. You're going to get more glycogen depletion, acid stressing the energy energetic pathways. It makes perfect sense that those would adapt somewhat preferentially if you're stressing them. So even if you go, you know, like I said, sarcoplasm, maybe it becomes limiting. There's an old theory. God, who was it? It's the full bag theory of muscle growth. Man, I wrote about it somewhere. This is like 30 years ago. And and it was kind of this idea that a muscle is just like this bag of fluid. And it's like that the bag can get so full with that it doesn't have any room to grow. And it's like, all right, maybe that's what just even with that, we alternate some heavy tension work. Once you get the fibers that they have no more room to grow, well, now you need to pump up your sarcoplasmic work and do a pump cycle or whatever, or you just do a little bit at the same time, like you said, staying in that kind of traditional rep range and then topping it off on the on the ends. Um, you know, if you're the kind of person that gets bored real easily, do them sequentially, or if you just really, like you said, I'm looking forward to the point where we can better identify what a given individual's weakness is. You know, we're not there yet. I think some of it will just be kind of observational, like we talked about early. If you're gassing, well, I mean, okay, if your workout's three hours long, your workout's probably dumb, right? Number, I mean, don't get me wrong. There again, powerlifters, it takes you takes them forever. But if you're a bodybuilder and you're doing a three hour workout, you're probably training very inefficiently because you're doing flat bench, dumbbell bench, flat machine bench flat cable crossover. Guys, those are all the same movement, okay? <laughs> you do not need four movements to train the same thing, but that's what you see. Then you do incline bench, dumbbell incline, machine incline, incline fly. Okay, guys, are all the same movement. Do you not need six biceps exercises? You're just bending the arm. Anyway, so like, yeah, that. but if you're trying to do, you know, a 90-minute workout that's 24, and, and by the last half hour, you're just gassed. Or if you're finding that, I mean, the thing with the rep drop off, it could be that your fitness is bad. It could be that you're just not cut out to do 12s on the first set. Maybe in that case, you go, all right, I'm going to try to do four sets of eight at the same relative intensity, right? Let's say that 12 was two reps in reserve. You could have gone two more to limit failure and just, oh, boom, you just fall off 12, eight, six, you know, it happens. Maybe you try eights. And you go, all right, cool, I can go eight, eight, seven, six. Well, you've just learned something. Again, is it neurological, biochemical, psychological? You know, I don't know. And I I want to know because I'm I I I am a nerd, but at the end of the day, practically, I don't care. 
in a very practical sense, I don't, it's like, again, I know I keep going back to the well, same music powerlifting, thing, but I train her, like her training is so unique to her that I described it and it's really fascinating, but I don't know that I would know, apply it to anybody, right? Anything more than one rep in the squat or technique falls apart. Partly just because she's not built to squat. Like she does almost exclusively singles. Most people would, ne now they're not maximum singles. She also, she loses a ton of top end strength if we do anything below about 85% is useless for her. For reps, because I did back in the day, but like, I yeah, just do three sets, eight in the squat. And she'd never get past like 95 pounds. You know, now for singles, she's squatting, you know, 235, right? She's not built for reps, physiological, anatomical. I don't really care in the big picture. I don't really care. And same thing, if you're, you can do four sets of eight without a big rep drop off and a set of 12 will blow you up for the rest of the workout. Well, you're as a bodybuilder, do you care? If you can do four sets of eight and add weight more rapid, because again, like I said most people or a lot of people cannot add reps ever. Even with sets, right? I frequently, we could get into the issue. How do we adjust the weight? Do you have to get all four sets? Let's say you're doing four sets of eight two reps in reserve, you're probably going to go two, one, one, zero, right? Do we wait until the fourth set is two reps in reserve? Do we adjust it based on the first set performance and then drop the weight, right? I think whatever Birkin calls reverse pyramid training, which is nothing new at all. Like you start heavier and then you drop the weight, like whatever. Well, I've seen people, or even some of the old models are like, all right, you stay at the same weight, you get four sets of eight. And they'll go 8877, 8877. They will never, ever, ever get the last two reps. Ever. I don't, it doesn't, it just for whatever, for whatever reason, it's never going to happen for months. And you go, okay, this is not an effective progression for you. At which point, like, okay, I'm going to maybe you just the first set. Add weight on that one and then drop weight. Maybe if you go three reps in reserve, you can do it. But okay, you're trading a little bit of vault. Maybe just add, because then you will see people that you add the weight and they still get 8877, right? That staying at the same weight, they were never going to get to 8888, but you add weight and they still get the same 887. So screw it. Just forget trying to get just, that's their drop. It's just who they are as a person. And for bodybuilding, it doesn't matter. For performance, strength performance, it probably still doesn't matter. It's just you're using a progression that is like trying to use 6 to 12. Oh, just add a rep till you get to 12. Some people will never, ever do it, ever. Beginners always can, but some people and don't do it. Because it goes 6 to 8. They can't ever get to 8. Just do strength sets to 6. <laughs> and add weight every couple of weeks. You know, watch bar speed. So some and that, that does seem to be very individual. Um, but I think, like I said, hopefully one of these days we'll be able to really identify what any given individual's holdup is to know, you know. Because like I said, if, you've, if it's mitochondrial function, maybe some aerobic work. Even high rep, short rest, we'll get a little bit of that. We'll get some mitochondrial adaptations going. <clears throat> maybe that's what they need to do for maybe that couple week block. We'll give them enough of a, an improvement to actually get more growth. Um, out of the hypertrophy work. And again, maybe you're like, ah, I did it heavy. I did the heavy, low volume stuff, but boom, I changed to higher rep, short rest, and I started growing. It's like, well, okay. Um, who am I who am I to argue? Well, I'm me, but you know, <laughs> if that's what it, I'm me, that's who I am. But by and large, it's like, okay, if that's what you've is is started working because this other model wasn't, or this other theoretically optimal approach wasn't working, then cool, end of the day. Progress is kind of what matters. Um, you know, the androgen receptor thing is interesting. I don't know if we can do much with that, but it's becoming very clear in the research that some people are lucky. They are hyper responders. They are, they won the genetic lottery and the rest of us, not so much. Um, so the solution for anyone that's in my group, as you know, is always 600 milligrams. That's all. All of your problems. 
I think that sums up the the crux of the matter extremely well. Um, if 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 we leave the listeners with a practical takeaway here, it's kind of that you know, but it's going to require a little bit of experimentation. But do we have a weak link in the chain, or is this who you are? And, yeah, and both are, are very well thing. possible. Yeah, and I mean it is like I. I and they are, you know, and I know it's, you want to wrap that we need to wrap this up, but it's like they are, well, there's the debate. Some studies are finding there are non-responders and others are like, yeah, in the aerobic realm, especially they're like, ah, but if they do higher intensity work or more aerobic work, suddenly they start get, but it's, it's only proportional. Suddenly instead of zero, they get five. You put some people on a program, endurance work, and they will get a 40% improvement of VO2 max. And you put another group on the identical program and they'll get a 5% or less. Now, you could argue, well, maybe they just needed an individual program. Maybe it's because we gave them the same, which, yes, there is truth to that. But at the same point, like, I mean, that's, again, in the endurance realm, <laughs> what did I read? Some endurance athlete who is an elite, he was born with a 75 VO2 max, right? 80, like 90 is like, 1995 is like the highest value ever recorded. Most people who train start at like 30, might get to 45. I think I got to about 60 through years of training, right? Which is good, but the elites, he was born higher than most people will get with years of training. And he probably was highly trainable so that when he started training, he jumped to 90, right? You have, you know, great athletes are born and then made the training has to be there, but we've all seen that guy who does the stupidest training and blows up, and we just get frustrated at them. And you've got guys that do everything according to the best science, the best training, but and just never get anywhere with it. And they're just not built for it, you know, and it sucks. Um, I don't think that's really been looked at in the resistance training hypertrophy realm so much. There's even there's a famous study from years ago. They looked at uh frame size i think which there's always been that idea like ah if you've got you know narrow wrists or whatever like that's a, a predictor they took people that had their had a, a high thick frame or light frame size and they trained them and the heavier frame size same training program gained like a kilo and a half two kilos of muscles like five pounds and like zero now we could say ah the light group screwed go run maybe they need a different training program maybe that gets into the whole somatotype thing maybe there's actually something to it despite the fitness industry deciding to having decided that it's all crap different we'll do that we'll do that podcast a different time because <laughs> there is an element of truth to it some people but there is no doubt even in the research in five years this is my prediction we are going to realize that every almost every study we've done today was not measuring what we thought it was measuring. Because all these studies, most of them, they take a group of people, we're going to compare 30 people, 10 on each program. Right? And you look at the results, and the variability is huge. Right? For however many sets or whatever they're comparing, the variability is huge. Some guys grow better on this, some guys grow better on the lower volume, some guys lose size, this and that and the other. And there's a lot of reasons for that. But they've done a couple studies lately where they take an individual and they train one arm with one training program and the other arm with a different training program. So they're self-control. What they find is that there is, let me make sure I get this right, there's like 30 times more variability between two, two people than there is within the same person. So the guy that grows well on training program one grows well on training program two and probably grows better than training number two on either of them. So what we're really seeing, what we're not measuring in these studies is which volume is best, which set rep combination is rush. What we are measuring is which group was lucky enough to get the hyper responders and which group wasn't. We are measuring who is and who aren't the hyper responders. And it's going to, and that's what it, I think bodybuilding almost more than any other activity is genetic in this sense. It just, if you're lucky, if you got the luck of the draw, and that's what the work is showing on ribosomes, mitochondria, et cetera. But yeah, all these studies, all we're seeing is like, ah, you happen to get, because some of the birth control studies are like this. They'll be like, all right, hypertrophy for nine out of 10 women was here. And then there's one person up here. So the average is higher, right? Because you had this stupid outlier. 
that pulled the entire average. Because if you if you block that off, I know this is not statistics, suddenly they're identical. But all you need is one freak show to throw the entire curve off. That's why the individual results are, tend to be more interesting in terms of where'd they start. How, and you look, you look at the data and it's like, yeah, boom, boom, couple lost, couple were flat in any given group. But when you aggregate the data, so all it takes is one or two freak, freak shows in one group to suddenly make it look like the group, that, that volume or set or whatever was superior. And maybe it was on average, but any given individual, there was no way to tell. I mean, similar to that, if we consider that recent OB study, which had the three volume groups, and they actually took into consideration the subject's baseline volume, if you look at the individual results, there are people who grew really well in every group. And if you look at the lowest volume group, for the vast majority of those individuals, it was lower volume than they've been doing. Right. So then, like like you said, if we consider everything we know about exercise science research, especially nowadays with the obsession with volume, it's like, well, more volume is better. It's like, right. well... Are, are we looking at the wrong thing? Like, if we consider this all paper where we finally took into account the subject's training history, it, is is some of this just like a product of like they did something different? <laughs> and right. That's yes, what exactly. You know, like, and if you even want to get way, you know, way up your rear end, it's like, all right, so they came out of this high volume workout and you reduce their volume and maybe they got, they took advantage of what I jokingly and half seriously call the long term delayed growth effect, which is sort of a play on the long term delayed training whatever from super training and it's like but there is right there is this weird phenomenon that you do all this my specialization cycles take advantage of this for six weeks you just pound that muscle when you cut the volume you keep growing it's really weird i can't maybe it's glycogen and water i suspect but there there's something going on right even in sports you've always tried to get that 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 overshoot of training after you bury the people and it's like huh maybe they were doing so much volume that they um, finally were able to grow because they weren't being over. But yeah, there is. That is a big factor. There's also that one weird paper that was interesting, but not where they took a bunch of people and they either doubled their volume or put them on an individualized. That maybe they cut their volume in half. I, was that the Scarpelli paper where yeah, they either they, they either put everyone on a standard volume or yeah. they or they took their baseline volume and, and increased it by twenty percent? Yeah, it was that one. And like, and it was interesting because it was like I think forget which group on average did better, but when you looked at the problem was is that all right? Some people were doing ten sets a week, and other people were doing like forty sets a week. So it's like all right. What were we doing? One group was going from 10 to 12 sets. One group was going to 40 to nearly 50 sets with adding 20, whereas the others were being brought down to like 20 sets a week. And like the data, the way they presented the data, what I would have wanted to see was the individ individuals, which individuals started and where did they end up? Because what I suspect would have was happening is if someone was doing way too many sets, they probably got a better result because the fixed set number was like 15 or 20 or something mm -hmm. that I suspected that the guys that were doing 40 got better results because they were being brought down from way too much. And the guys doing low volume, same thing. And the guys in the middle probably saw the better result from the 20% because they were already close, but they didn't present the data in a way such that you could analyze it that way. Because Yes, the conclusion was interesting, individualizing volume, because a lot of people were like, oh, see, there are no absolute volume recommendations. Individ yeah, <laughs> but that's not what the paper said. I don't disagree. It was like, see, some people may need 45 sets a week. Oh, <laughs> stop. Just, just stop. You all agree with me now 18 months later, so just stop, because you can't <laughs> conclude that from the paper. And I'm not disagreeing that maybe there are individual volume, but the way that paper was structured... I don't, like I said, my speculation is that the ones who were brought, whether high or low to the median, saw benefit from one approach. The ones are already close, maybe didn't see any real difference because they were already, you know, if you had 20% to 16, you're at 20. And if you take 16 to 20, you're at 20. So it, it's kind of a wash. Um, but I do think, you know, that is something that needs to be, but how do you do it? How do you take an individual and unless you're doing one arm versus the other, which is one leg versus the other, which is at least something um, to see what is going to be sort of optimal for any given individual. But like I said, I think at this point, we're all basically, sorry, they're all basically in mm -hmm. agreement with me from that. Yeah, somewhere between 
10 and 20 set hard sets a week, you know, maybe I will even concede a little bit more. There was that paper, not all um, weird leg extension paper you might have seen that I think is really interesting. That I will then we'll wrap up, which was they did one leg, did three sets to failure. The other set leg did three, did sets not to failure, but did a matched volume load. Right. So they had to do however many extra sets to match the volume load. And then they did it the opposite. They did one leg, did sets not to failure, and then the other group, and then one group didn't match volume load. The, the non batching matching volume load didn't grow the same. Where they matched volume load, they did. Right. So basically, the three sets to failure and the multiple sets not to failure, as long as the volume load was matched, the growth was the same. Aha! I think that volume might have been is show and felt actually. No, no, it's more it's more recent. Hang on, I can pull it up while we're talking. Aha! Volume is the primary driver of growth. Yeah, well, that's not really how I would interpret that, but that's just me. Um, I think it's Lacerda. Performing repetitions to failure less important than volume for muscle hypertrophy and strength. Um, yeah. Each leg was allocated in one of two unilateral training protocols, either failure or non-failure. But, but what the, the take home, and it wasn't untrained, which I just like, was that the three set to failure group to match the volume load, not going to failure, took about 50% more sets. And vice versa, to, to achieve the same volume as like five sets of non-failure work took like two sets to failure. And I have a feeling that if you parse some of the supposed discrepancy in the research, the ones that are defining failure as form failure or like stopping way short of failure, of course you need 15 sets because those 15 sets are the equivalent of eight sets to true failure. And I think that's where the I think that's where the contradiction will will disappear is that, yeah, if and in the effective reps framework, I think that makes perfect sense. Set to failure gets five effective reps. So not to failure gets two. You need two and a half times as many sets to achieve the same effective stimulus. But we need they need to start doing the right studies and doing more endless volume studies, comparing individuals. Like I said, they do need to take into account previous volume. One paper I did see, and I don't remember what it was, they took the group and they asked them, you know, they got what is your previous training volume, but then they distributed them at least evenly. And they were like, all right, so each group got like three from the different previous weekly volumes in an attempt to balance that out. So, collusion, folks, 600 milligrams. Then you don't have to worry about any of this. I promise. And if you don't no. know what I'm talking about, that's probably fine. <laughs> and then you should probably also join the group on Facebook and, and get yourself some brain gains. Yeah, because <laughs> we we do we en we endlessly do. the 600 milligrams thing is from the the big early steroid study by Basin where 600 milligrams of anabolics built muscle without even training, and uh, that's like I said, take enough drugs and none of this matters. So. <laughs> Absolutely. I think the listeners got a gift with this one, Lyle. We, we covered all of our discussion topics and, and a little bit more. This was a just comprehensive discussion on training. A lot to take away here. The listeners are going to enjoy it just as much as I did. I know that for a fact. But that does it for another episode of the Muscle Memoirs podcast. Thank you so much for your time, Lyle. We really appreciate Absolutely, it. Mike. Thanks so much. Hey, guys. Mike here. If you're interested in learning more about how to maximize your health, body composition, and performance, head over to hammerawayfitness.com where you can sign up for coaching or even just schedule an hour consult with me to get some of your training and nutrition questions answered. Also, if you enjoyed this episode as much as I did and would like to further support the growth of the Muscle Memoirs podcast, you can give a donation to the link in the show notes, leave us a review, and or share this episode with your friends, whether that be dropping the link in a group chat or putting a screenshot in your Instagram story. I truly appreciate it.